you. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. We'll be talking about image management. Are your images golden, gilded, or tarnished? And this is us. We're all from Symantec. I'm Brad. I primarily work on Horizon. And this is Richard, who works on our image management solution. And this is Tim, who has been working on Glance. First, we'll cover why image management is important in your cloud. Then we'll talk about building, validating, and distributing images. Then eliminating vulnerabilities in live VMs. Delegating image curation responsibilities. Then we'll have a demo of a new feature in Glance called Community Images. Then we'll talk about unified image management and hybrid clouds. And then we'll have demos of the image pipeline that we use in Symantec and a technology we call the Dominator. So why is image management important in your cloud? For one thing, protecting capacity. So using quotas to restrict how much a user can use uh, in, in your cloud as far as uh, storage capacity. Um, and this prevents any one project from creating a bunch of images and taking up all the storage in the cloud. Preventing confusion. So users need to know which images have been blessed by an admin and which are just random uploads from other users that might be full of vulnerabilities. Exposing provenance, or in other words, uh, knowing where an image came from or who made it available in the first place. Ensuring freshness, so is the image free of vulnerabilities and bugs? Is it the latest uh, security patches that are in that image? Controlling publication and delegation of images. Um, so in our case, we only let cloud admins make an image public. And all other image management delegation for other classes of images is delegated to the users. Managing images across hybrid clouds, and so you may be using the same images across different cloud providers, but managing those images should look the same across the clouds. And we all do some form of image management, but often it looks very ugly. So in the beginning, we start out with a, a good situation where we build some good images, uh, deploy them into VMs, and here we have golden images, uh, and we're good to start out with. But either through being too lazy or too scared to, um, to create a new image and push it out to the running VMs, you get these uh, running VMs that uh, vulnerabilities are discovered in the images, new bugs are discovered, and so they tarnish. And that gets us into a bad situation. And so what often happens is just the hack, patch, and release, where you release a new image and but you don't push that directly to the running VMs. So those running VMs are still out there with tons of vulnerabilities in them, and that's an ugly situation to be in. So next, I'll turn it over to Richard to talk about how we deal with some of these problems. OK. Thank you, Brad. OK. Um, so when we want to uh, build, validate, and distribute our images, um, to start off with, uh, you want to be able to build your images quickly. Uh, you want to be able to do this reliably and repeatedly. So, you know, so if you do one build, you do the next, um, you will get a successful build. And assuming you didn't actually specify changes in the content, you will actually will get essentially the same image um, come out of um, the build first, second, third, fourth, and, and so forth times. Uh, quick builds are important, of course, because if you're in a, a short sort of you know, iteration cycle with development, if you have to wait hours for a new image to be built, then you spend a lot of, lot of, lot of your time you know, sort of playing sabers with your cube mate. Uh, and your manager might think that's a waste of your time. Uh, so building, for those who've seen the XKCD comic. Um, <clears throat> Um, so validation, um, so you need, you need to ensure that the image um, is of high quality and it's secure. So high quality, you need to run regression tests. So you'll have the confidence that when you do actually come out to push this image, that it's going to work. It's not going to uh, break your fleet. Um, and for security, you, you need to run vulnerability scans. Um, even if your image is good today, tomorrow it might not be good. Um, so you will have to rerun these scans periodically. 
Um, then it comes to actually distributing the images. How, how do you distribute? So conventionally, people who are building image pipelines, they say, OK, well, you know, I upload my image to Glance, um, and I declare victory. I, I, I'm done for the day. It's 5 PM. It's quitting time. Everything, everything is good. But then you know, fast forward you know, a year, and then you have thousands of tarnished VMs because they haven't been updated. They're stale. There's lots of vulnerabilities. And you know, we're, we're suddenly in a crisis. A new, a new vulnerability has been discovered, and it's like you know, P0, high priority. It's, it's code red. And then this is when your, all your operations people are going to be spending uh, many hours at night uh, trying to somehow do a live patch on all these systems without breaking your production traffic. Um, so to solve this, um, one important key is uh, the dominator. This is a technology which I'll sort of talk a bit uh, more about uh, in the coming slides. But this is, this is a mechanism to allow you to actually um, take a, sort of a fully built image with your application stack and actually push it out to your fleet and have confidence that the update process is fast and reliable and secure. Um, a key takeaway is that um, when you're thinking about manage, managing images, you shouldn't think about in terms of releasing images, but you should think in terms of pushing. Because when you think about in, in the terms of releasing images, you think, yes, OK, I upload to Glance, and I'm, I'm finished. So your, your quality bar that you set for yourself is actually not that high, because what's the, what's the price of failure? Well, OK, people will spin up new VMs with this image, which yeah, maybe isn't quite so good, the regression tests aren't, don't have as, enough, as much coverage as you would expect. Um, OK, people will just revert to the old image, not a problem. But if you're actually going to go push the image to all your running systems, OK, then is when the fear factor comes in. That's good, because that means that you're going to set the high quality bar for yourself, because you don't want to screw this up. OK, so. Um, so this, this is um, yeah, how, how do you eliminate the vulnerability in the live VM? So as, as I mentioned earlier, you, know, you, you build a new image, and then you need to push it out to the machines. Um, so the, the reality is that you know, via, vulnerabilities will, will be discovered, and you will need to patch. And then the question is, how do you, how do, you do that? And you want to be able to do that sort of, you know, safely, and you want to have confidence in doing it. It's only when you actually have confidence in the quality of your images and the quality of the deployment mechanism that you will actually then change your mindset and you know, get into this mold where you say, OK, we have a vulnerability, we'll, we'll build a new image, and we'll roll it out. Um, so how do you uh, build these images? You, you start with some kind of golden you know, baked image. Um, and that contains your operating system and your application stack, uh, including all configuration information that's specific to your application. Uh, then you run it through a fully automated uh, testing uh, pipeline. Uh, so that, that will, with, with a, a sufficient number of uh, regression tests, you'll have confidence that your know, image is of, of quality and that it is actually safe to start pushing. Then you actually push the image to all your target machines. You want to use a technology that ensures that um, the transitions are, are very fast, uh, robust, and complete. So, you want a fast transition because when you're changing a machine essentially from one operating system version to another, um, even if it's a minor uh, upgrade, there's a lot of, lot of changes, inter interdependencies. Um, if you look at the, the package management approach to updating a machine, what's actually happening is a whole bunch of machine, uh, packages are being updated, their dependencies and their, their sub-dependencies and so forth all get updated. So there's a large window on the machine where the system is actually in a potentially in inconsistent state. You want to narrow that time window because that, that in that time window, if you start something new on the machine, uh, even if it's just some application that's continuously running but sort of, you know, spawns off another binary, um, there's, a, there's a chance that things will not work because you might have incompatible libraries versus the, uh, the binary that you, you're running. So um, you reduce your risk by narrowing uh, the update window. You want to make sure that uh, a transition is robust, that it, it, it either it's not going to work or it worked. And there's no kind of like halfway through updates, because that, again, is the path to lots of damage across the fleet. Um, and, and you also want to know that when, when it says it's done, it's, it's done. It's not like, well, you may have to run it a few more times, like when you <coughs> puppet, um, to, to make sure it actually converges to some sort of approximate uh, solution, but that it's, it's, it's done and it's, you know, the, the job is complete. Um, 
And so uh, for efficiencies, we actually want to send uh, differences over the network. We don't actually ship entire images because they can be multi-gigabytes. You just want to ship the files which are changed. And the system that uh, implements uh, this pushing is called the Dominator. And so a very uh, brief architectural overview of, of the Dominator. Um, the, the heart of it is right there, the Dominator. Um, and so what this does, it continuously uh, polls all the machines in your fleet, asking them essentially, what have you got? Okay, so each of the machines, that, these are the, the, the subs at the bottom, so those are your, your end nodes. Those are the machines that are being dominated. And they, they individually um, continuously scan the local file systems. They, they run a, a, a SHA-512 checksum uh, scan. And so they, they build up uh, essentially um, it's a representation of the file system state. And then the dominator will poll all those to get the file system state, compares um, the file system state with the um, image that, is, that each machine is supposed to have. So the image, the name of the image comes from your machine database. And so the dominator reads the machine database to say, okay, what is the list of machines I should scan uh, or poll? And what image should each of those machines have? It pulls the, uh, the essentially the metadata that the file system representation for the image from the image server, compares what the sub has to what the what image it's supposed to have. If there are any deviations, then it instructs the sub to fetch the files from the image server, and then perform an update. So that's the basic architecture. At the top line, you'll see file generators. These are computed files. So if you want to have dynamically generated content. Uh, say that um, you have a, a file on, on the file system which changes depending on which host name it is, what MDB attributes it has, then file generators can be used to insert uh, dynamic content. Okay, and now I'll hand it over to Tim. Thank you, Richard. Hello? Is this on? Yes, it is. Yep. Cool. So currently in Glance, that was a step. There are two explicit uh, visibility values. There was public and there's private. But of course, you can add members to the private, so it's also kind of shared. Currently in flight, I've got the community images patch. It's targeting Okada. And it does two things. One is it makes shared its own explicit value. And two, it actually adds the new community value. And how these work. You have the public images. Uh, it's exactly the same as it used to be. Everybody can access the image, and it appears in everybody's default image list. For shared, it's functionally identical to the way that uh, private is today. If, uh, if it's shared and there's no members, then it's only visible to the owner, and it only shows up in the owner's image list. Once you add a member, then that member can access the image. And once the member status becomes accepted, then the image will show up in their default image list. And finally, you have the new value community, which is a different way of sharing. It's kind of the opposite, where everybody can access a community image, but it doesn't show up for anybody's image list. You have to explicitly request to list uh, the community images, otherwise they're invisible. And what we're recommending is that your golden images the ones that your admins tightly control, they keep curated, those should be the only public images. And then when you have users who want to publish their own images, that's where the community value comes in. They should use community. They can still, uh, they can still do what they want to do, but you can educate your users. The difference is you can trust the public ones because we're on top of it. The community is buyer beware. And now for an example of how this might look in Horizon, I'll turn it over to Brad. And so to give you a visual on uh, how this is all going to look, and as just a reminder, um, this community images feature in Glance has not made it into Newton, but it's planned to make it into Okata. So I'm talking about some things that, that should make it into the next release of OpenStack. And to give you an idea of just what it looks like, um, we do have this implemented in our internal environment. Um, and we can share that source code if it's something that you'd like to see. So just um, let us know directly if you'd like to see that. Um, 
but we have it implemented on the glance side, and then this is what our screens look like in Horizon, which also supports it. Um, so here we're logged into Horizon, and this is probably familiar to a lot of you. You'll see that this project has no images that it owns. It's got a, an image that's shared with it already, and this is um, based on how image sharing works uh, currently. Nothing, nothing new there. Then they have public images, and then we have this new tab for the community list. And so if we go over to the public tab, you'll see uh, we have this list of public images, which again are the, the ones that are blessed by the cloud admin. And users who are looking at this know that these are good images. Uh, these have the latest security updates, the latest bug fixes, and so basically they're ready for uh, any kind of use. Then if they go to the community list, we keep a, a strong separation between these two. Anyone in the cloud can create a community image, and so whatever is here is uh, not necessarily to be trusted. Um, and by doing that, we reduce the amount of damage that an individual actor could do, um, where we have this expectation that if, if they put up a community image, then we keep that out of the public list. And so, for one thing, we don't spam, the pub spam up the public list with all these random images. But for another thing, that we have a clear separation of what's trusted and what's not trusted. And so, the next thing I'll talk about uh, is a feature that we've implemented that will probably make it into OpenStack community later, but is, is not planned at this point. But if a user wanted to, to work with a community image, and they wanted to uh, basically bookmark it, we do have this new bookmark image button, um, or can be done via the CLI as well. And so if they bookmark that image, then you'll see they've got a new image that shows up in the shared list. And so this is where they can, anytime they request their shared list, they'll see this image come up. And at this point, they can launch the image, boot instances with it, otherwise work with it. And if they've done everything they want to do with that and want to get it out of their shared list, then, then they can hit the Remove Bookmark button. And as expected, no longer in the shared list. Of course, it's still in the community list. So if they decide later they want to go and work with that again, they can always add it back or just launch it directly without uh, bookmarking it. Um, but hopefully this gives you an idea of of what community images is about and how it could help you uh, with, with your image management strategy in general. And next, I'll turn it back to Richard for info on hybrid clouds. Thank you. OK, so, um, so, so Matic has built um, a private cloud based on OpenStack. Um, but we also are now uh, consuming sort of public cloud, in particular um, Amazon, but we're also looking at uh, other public cloud providers. And that's because um, they, are, you know, they, they have basically presence where it would, be, um, it would take us a long time um, to add data centers, and it would be so perhaps uh, more expensive than it's really worth doing it, uh, given the, the revenue we'd expect in those uh, regions. So we have to have a hybrid cloud strategy. And so part of that is, to how, is how do you build images? Uh, so you can build sort of different images for different clouds, and you can like, you know, tune them each individually and sort of have different content. But that doesn't give you a good hybrid experience. Um, a, a real hybrid experience is where you essentially have the same image in all your environments, whether it be OpenStack, or AWS, or GCP, or Azure. Um, so um, the, essentially, so this, this is kind of a conceptual diagram of how, how to do um, image building um, and deployment, well, I should say management, in a hybrid cloud environment. So you start off with you know, templates, essentially, in, in Git, which describe the content of your image, which is, think of it essentially as a, a list of packages that you want. And so that can be for a base image plus the specific applications that you care about for your stack. Uh, those are in Git. Then you have a trigger, and that when, you, when, you, when there's a, uh, a new commit uh, put in, then a content builder kicks off and actually builds essentially a file system image, a sort of um, an almost complete file system image with 
all your content. So it's, it's a file system tree. It's a compressed tar file, basically. And then that feeds into a number of target or environment specific builders. So there's one for Ironic, if you're going to be, if you may want to run on bare metal, so you, you push it into the Ironic uh, builder, it puts the extra special wrapping around it and can upload it to Glance so you have an Ironic, an Ironic image. Um, you have another one for OpenStack uh, virtual machines. Again, there's a builder and it goes into Glance. For Amazon, you have an AMI builder and then you push that into uh, an a into uh, Amazon machine image list. It's like, it might be EBS backed or, or it might be an instance backed. Um, and you can also push into the Donmator system if you actually want to do live updates on machines. Um, so in the, you see there's a, there's a lot of commonality with these different environments that you have a number of tests uh, run. You have blocking tests, um, and a blocking test, the definition is that if the, if the test doesn't pass or doesn't complete, then the image release is, is automatically blocked. So these are your uh, non-flaky tests and the, the, your must-have tests, where you kind of say, look, th these, these are things that must always be okay for me to even consider making, to, for finishing the, uh, the release of this image. And then you have non-blocking tests. And a good example of this is vulnerability and compliance scans. Um, you know, we use a product like um, Qualys for our vulnerability scans, and it can generate a lot of false positives. So there's, there's, there's basically no way you want to hold up an image release because you might get some false positives there. This is really something that the human has to go in and look at because it's, it's hard to automatically determine whether it's a pass or fail. Um, and there's also a judgment call of whether or not this is uh, severe enough uh, vulnerability to hold up the release train. So those are non-blocking tests. But the basic pattern is the same in all these cases where you have blocking tests. If they pass, you release and notify. Um, email, Slack channel updates, whatever plugins you might decide are needed for notification. And then hours, days later, depending on the nature of the tests um, or the scans that are being done in images, then you uh, have a notification. So this is a conceptual diagram of how to do hybrid uh, image uh, management sort of right in a, um, by having sort of as, as much as possible a seamless experience. So the, the fact that you, know, you may be running on an Amazon VM or an OpenStack VM should be mostly hidden from you so that you have essentially the same content um, in both those environments. OK, so now for a little demonstration of our image pipeline. Um, oh, I need to escape that out of this and switch here. So we are using Spinnaker. Um, I have to log back in. This is this is security. <laughs> and this is how you make it not quite as painful. Okay, so um, so yes, yeah, so some of you may have heard of Spinnaker. It's essentially um, a sort of. A, an orchestration engine um, that was developed at Netflix and has become quite popular. Um, we only use a subset of its uh, feature set, uh, which is uh, pipelines, because we have a complicated pipeline for building images, and this is actually still in development. We were sort of uh, building out to new environments. We're um, c combining the, the different uh, build pipelines into sort of a more s into a single unified pipeline, but that's sort of a work in progress. Um, to, but to give you an idea of sort of the, the complexity um, of um, these pipelines, it's like there's about, about 25 different stages. So here we see a configuration stage at the beginning. You can see my mouse? Okay, yes. Um, then we, we you know, launch a seed machine so we can actually upload the image into Amazon. We build the image in parallel. We you know, input it to Amazon, um, you know, spin up a, a VM. Then you do testing. Okay, so these would be the blocking tests. Then there's a, at this stage, we have like a manual testing as well. A human can actually, if they want, make a decision, log into the machine, see if things still look okay. As we get more confidence with our automated tests, we may just turn off the manual testing so we, we don't need to do this anymore. Um, update the version number, um, a few things like that. Then we make updates in Confluence where we can uh, register the, the image, um, details about the image build, um, any logs and so forth. Uh, and then we have pushes into different um, accounts that we have in AWS. Um, and then any, any follow-up manual actions that we may want to take, um, like reg reg registering the images um, with other um, systems. And then further updates when the image is actually released. And then um, notifications. 
So this, just, this is just a quick sort of walkthrough to give the idea of like, um, there's actually a lot of steps involved in you know, sort of doing just an image build and releasing it, let alone actually pushing it to machines. And an example of a recently sort of completed image, you can see here um, all the different stages the different pipelines take. And actually one of the, um, our, one of our pain points right now is actually um, copying images into, from one Amazon account in, into another. Uh, and so we're actually looking at optimizing that. So this is sort of uh, in, in development, but it does follow the, the basic principle that I outlined in the, the other slide. And going back to the presentation. Um, okay, so next was, no, okay, no. Oh, I lost the spot. Okay, yes, demo, demoing the dominator. Okay, so that's, um, the last demo. Okay, so this is the system I was talking about earlier. Um, so again, it just, the dominator is continually scanning all the subs. The subs are scanning the local file system. If there's any changes, the dominator will then correct them. So a, an image deployment becomes flipping which image is the required image, the image that should be on the machine. That, that's, that is all an image push is. Um, as far as the dominator system is concerned. Whether it's correcting random changes on the machine or is actually pushing out a new image, uh, at, the, at the bottom level it's all the same. It's what, what is the image that it's supposed to have now and if it's not the same, make it so. And so um, this is really difficult to demonstrate at, at really large scale, but I, I, I thought a, a good demonstration is to show um, how well it works with restoring a system. So you may notice here on the right hand side um, this is kind of the command of fear. <laughs> if you would do this on a, on a normal system, um, you've, you've hosed yourself, right? It's, it's, it's kind of terrible. Um, but let's go ahead and do it. Um, and now I want to I see um, how big my file system is. I, I can't even do that anymore. I can't even show you that the thing is almost empty because all my commands are gone. So if I now go to the, the dominator, okay, and just watch the dashboard, it's the bottom one. And you see it's fetching which means it's already picked up that, oh, okay, things are wrong, there's, there's missing files, so it's, it's told the, the, the sub, okay, go fetch the files from the image server. And if I click again, um, oh, okay, sub not ready. What this means, it's actually finished fetching, it's done the update, it's just doing a restart and sort of rescanning its file system. Um, and any second now, okay, now it's just doing a double check, you know, is everything um, the way it's supposed to be? And a few more seconds. Okay, it's it saw it saw that you think okay, it's synced, which means it's finished. And now if I do this, I have a file system back again. Oops. Oh, I've got a file system again. So that took a little under a minute for that two point two gigabytes of content that had to be fetched and restored. Um, so that's just a, a simple demonstration of the dominator. Um, so this, this, is, this is a technology that's good for um, pushing images, whether, whether it's pushing uh, into VMs with your full application stack, or if you want to actually push hypervisors. So you've actually got a fleet of um, compute nodes and you want to manage those, keep them all in sync. Dominator is an excellent uh, you know, system for, for doing that. Um, if you want to talk to uh, me about that afterwards, that's fine. I also have um, so three copies of the design document and 20 copies each of like an architectural overview and a fact sheet if you're just um, kind of curious about it. It's all open source, it's on GitHub, and the links are on, on those pages. So feel free to pick up a copy if you're interested. Um, and now, going back to the presentation, I think we are finished. Yes. So thank you. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the, the subs, they're in, um, if I can go back. Um, they're in the MDB. 
So the MDB is the source of truth of your fleet, okay? Uh, MDB, some people sort of call the CMDB, Configuration Management Database. But it, it, it's a manifest of all the machines in your fleet and what images they should have, as well as any other metadata that may be interesting, like you know, who owns the machine, what role it's meant for, those sort of things. Yes? Oh, yeah. So the question is, how, how um, do you actually find out what the diffs are? Um, so the subs scan the local file system, so it builds up um, essentially a map of what the file system looks like. So it's, it's, it's recording the checksums of every file. Um, and the images are essentially, so there's, there's the objects which actually files themselves, and then there's a representation which shows the checksums for every file in an in image. And then the dominator compares um, it polls the subs, says, okay, tell me what is, you know, what is the state of your file system, and it compares that to the image, and if there's any differences, then it says you need to go fetch these files and make those updates. Does that explain it? What's that? Oh, uh, you mean from the image server? Or, uh, no, so the, um, when you upload an image to the image server, it's actually it's a compressed tar file. It's the format you just upload. Um, but internally, the image server breaks that apart into a separate object for every unique file. So and that's actually something I didn't mention. If you, you could upload hundreds or thousands of images, and if they're all essentially the same, like the same set of files, um, it's very cheap because it, it deduplicates every unique file because it does a SHA-512 checksum, and that's its index into the object store. So if, imagine if you have, um, you've built a base image and then people build derivative images on top of that with, you know, someone has Apache, you know, someone has MySQL or whatever. The vast bulk of those images are actually the same if you actually were to deduplicate all the, all the files. So in terms of storing on the image server, it's, you're only storing the extra images, you know, okay, you have to store Apache again and you have to store MySQL, but the base image, is, it's there already. So there's nothing new. That makes sense. Okay, so the sub, sub D. So there's an agent that runs on every node, and that does a continuous loop over the file system, uh, computing the checksums of every file. Um, I'm not. Because I'm, I'm thinking, because this sounds a lot like attestation. Like, but attestation, the, the reason why that's a trusted procedure is because you have a hardware proof of trust, right? So uh, you've got your key inside your hardware module, and you know that it's a mm -hmm. handle. Yeah. The, 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 this, um, the, 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 the primary goal here is to keep machines in sync and to have a safe deployment and update mechanism. Um, now you do get, because you are always continuously uh, scanning the, the, the checksums of the files on the file system, you can actually leverage that and get like a tripwire type uh, system on top of that. Sure. Right. It's maybe not as good as like doing TPM and so forth, but... Um, yes. Yes. This... E yes, that would, that they would, well, yes, but um, they would need to subvert sub D, right? They'd need to put in a replacement. Because if you see that it suddenly stops talking to you, then you know there's a problem. Um, is this, it, everything is, has signed certs for all the communications. So um, you know that it's sub D, you know, that's fetching files in the image server, and, and that's who you're talking to. It's a, um, although, actually, uh, it kind of matters less that you're, talking to sub D or not, because you really, your goal is kind of drive the machine into compliance and, and see if, if there's any deviations. Right? Um, it's not meant to be a full-on um, intrusion detection system, but it does, for free, essentially, kind of give you a large segment, so like a, a fairly large practical segment of that.
That'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, I haven't sort of thought about that. It, it does seem somewhat out of scope. Um, but when you're talking about like machine keys, I've actually, um, it's, it's certainly the case that with computed files, you can actually, a, a file generator can actually generate certs. And this is actually, DOM is an effective way of actually getting unique machine certs onto every machine. Um, you could extend that to sort of with a TPM. You, you do have the issue of like, how do you kind of get that initial trust, right? At some point you're sort of saying, you know, uh, I, it, it, it matters less that that, that that initial trust, you kind of, you, you can't trust the basic underlying environment, okay? You're looking really for like, after you've established that initial trust, is it, you know, does it appear to be breaking down or subverted? Uh, no, well, so the images are actually, um, well, they're, they're not signed, but the, the metadata does show who uploaded it, right? Um, and it depends exactly how you use signing. It, it, it can also be damaging. So what, one of the, the operational problems with signing is um, what happens if the signature becomes invalid, okay? And that's a, that's a dangerous thing. You can't, like, and there can be cases where, say, well, the the person who uploaded it, they signed the image. They're no longer with the company. Their certs become invalid. Suddenly you can't use that image and that might break production or people can't launch. And it's a, um, I, my, my view is it's better to um, have certainty that, you're, that authorized people upload the images right? and that you can trust the server, but the actual content, I see less value, especially because every file is just, you know, it, it's just checksum, right? So you can actually see an object um, that it's you know, essentially valid, okay, because it's self-signed in a sense because it's indexed by its checksum. Right? So you can't just tamper with files because if you do, if you were to actually tamper with the files on the uh, image server, um, then when a sub downloaded it, it would, it would do that and then it kind of see, well, the checksum doesn't match. There's a problem here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so the dominator will detect that there's a difference, right? Because it's asked the sub what you have, it kind of compares with the image server, and then it tells the sub to go f fetch whatever files are, are, are missing, okay, whatever files it doesn't have from the image server and it comes back. So the, 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 the thickness of the arrows indicates essentially the, the, the amount of data that's flowing. So you see the, sort of the, the, the largest amount is from the image server to the subs because that, that's the bulk of your data. No, no, you don't need to restart the VM unless you've changed the kernel. Okay, but if you've just changed Apache or MySQL, um, then all you need to do is restart those services. So part, part of the image, so the, an image is basically three things. Um, it's a compressed tar file with your content. Um, it's a filter file which says, look, these are the files just don't touch. Like etc, fs, tab, leave that alone because it's unique per machine. Um, although you could perhaps in certain environments actually compute that because you might have the same pattern on every machine. But that's getting, a, <laughs> you could do that, but it's, Probably simple not to do that. Um, and then there's um, triggers, which is a set, a, a set of um, essentially regular expression matches on files. So if a, um, a trigger, uh, if it matches, um, if, 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 if a file changes and it matches the regular expressions that are in a particular trigger, then it says restart this service. Um, and that can include the kernel, but it, most of the time it won't be the kernel that's changing, it's just some, a couple of apps. And so that those servers will restart. But so that the beauty of this is that you can do um, up live pushes without having to reboot machines. So you, you actually get a very lightweight um, update. Uh, well, this guy was actually first. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so the dominator sends, so, so th this thin line here is, that's the pull request, right? It's an RPC call. Um, and then coming back is the response. It's, it's more data, the, the request is uh, tiny. Um, and then 
Um, and if there are changes to be made, it sends an update RPC request, which gives, here's a list of files you need to fetch and then make changes to. Uh, well, fetch and then move into these places in the file system. Um, and then the sub contacts the image server and says, hey, I need this set of uh, objects. And then the image server responds with the objects. Um, similarly, a dominator sends a small request to MDB saying, like, what's the manifest of machines, including their metadata? And the MDB sends it back a larger payload, which is the manifest. Um, the dominator says to the image server, what's the list of images that exist? Um, and it gets back the images and the, the file system rep representations of the images, so the, the list of all the checksums and, and metadata protections and so forth. And then the file generators, if you have computed files, then the dominator on demand will query the file generator saying, hey, this file path for this machine, what's the data? And then the generator sends back the information and then the dominator will actually directly push that information to the sub. It doesn't go through the image server because it's dynamic. No, that's part of the dominator. It's, so, it's, so all, all this is part of the dominator system and that's um, its own system, yeah. It, it doesn't. So the, 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 the back-end storage at this point is just a local file system. Um, I have in the plan at some point to, you know, use an object storage system if, if needed, but it's going to be, for, at least for our use, um, I think for most people's use, it's like, you know, hundreds of gigabytes are actually cheap. Um, you know, well, actually, no, so I, should say, I should say hundreds of terabytes are actually cheap <laughs> these days. And so that's actually room for plenty of images. So um, at this point, there's no great need for um, using, an object, to implement an object storage back into like a separate one, like, you know, just, you know uh, I guess Swift or S3 or, or whatever. Um, the image servers do have full applications. So um, in, in our deployment, we have essentially a master image server where you upload the images to, and then there's a whole bunch of replicas. There's basically one per region, okay, and that's simply for latency reasons. Uh, but, but because of that, I, I have free replication, right? I don't need to do anything more magical. Uh, and if, I, if, if one of the image servers falls over in a in particular region, spin up another one, it just syncs up to the master, it fetches the content, I don't even have to you know, lift a finger. Um, if the master falls over, I'll just set up another one and temporarily point it at one of the, the slaves and again, I have all the data. Yes? Yes, that's, that's handled. So the, the images, uh, hard links and some, some links are all represented. Um, the only thing that isn't is sockets because it's, <laughs> it's actually a network call really to create them. It's not a file system. It's kind of just looks in the file system. But everything else, pipes, sim links, hard links. Um, so if you were to add a new hard link to the system, Dominator kind of sees that. And it doesn't actually need to fetch the file. It just actually does the hard link on the sub. And it's like, oh, okay, it's, the content's already there. Uh, Dominator is not um, a CMDB, right? It's it's a it's a it's an, it's, a, it's basically um, an enforcement system. Right? For it, say this is this is what you should have, and it enforces that. It always keeps systems in, in compliance. Your MDB, I mean that part there is your CMDB, right? So I think that's what you're talking about. So Dominator has a simple little driver hook in to some simple uh, MDBs, like you can have just have a JSON file if you wanted, because that, that's all you have. It has a driver for um, sort of, well, we have like an intermediate layer for OpenStack deployment, so we, we kind of use that. We also have sort of direct driver for like a AWS. Um, it's, Dominator itself is agnostic about um, the underlying cloud that it's on, because it, because it also is meant to be able to manage a cloud, right? It can be over for applications in VMs, but it can also be used for managing the cloud itself. Right. It's kind of a foundational technology. If there's no more questions, thank you very much for coming.
Okay. And there's, this paper's there if you want to um, grab some. <laughs>